Mike, I said that's all. Um, however, that is all the Japanese I speak. I'm very sorry. I will speak in English. If you have questions or I am too fast, please raise your hand uh, and I will try and slow down and explain. There will be time for questions at the end as well, so please think of some questions and I will look forward to answering them. So uh, today I wish to talk about uh, confidential computing, uh, what it is, why uh, it fits in the cloud, uh, and why it has to be open source. Everything should be open source, but particularly uh, confidential computing. I'll also talk a little bit about the work of the Confidential Computing uh, Consortium and how it is possible to get involved. But first, a little bit about me. That is me. I like tea because I'm British. Um, so that is like Japanese people who also like tea. Um, I am the author of, uh, of this book, uh, Trust in Computer Systems and the Cloud. Uh, and I'm also the executive director of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which we will speak about a little bit later on. <clears throat> but first, what is confidential computing? So, here is the brief description. I will explain a little bit more about what it is. It is the protection of the data in use, this is important, uh, using hardware-based a tested, trusted execution environment. So let us briefly uh, talk about those. The first thing is that data has three states. The first state is when it is in transit on the network, it is moving. So we use TLS or IPsec to protect it in, uh, in transit. It is uh, data at rest is the second state. So we might protect it in a database or an encrypted file system, for instance. The third is when it is being processed, when it is in RAM. And that is very difficult to protect, and we will talk a bit about that. Confidential computing uses hardware-based capabilities in chips, CPUs, GPUs, DPUs, for instance. And it is cryptographically attested. You have verifiable information. information which you can prove that it is working. Um, it is part of the family of privacy or privacy enhancing technologies like uh, fully homomorphic encryption or a secure multi party compute uh, and can work with those technologies. Um, it is less a competitor and more complementary. Uh, with those. It is available on almost all clouds right now. You can buy chips and computers which have it right now. It is very fast, unlike some technologies like homomorphic encryption. It is at close to normal processing speed. And you can use it for general computing. You don't need to uh, rewrite your algorithms, for instance, to use confidential computing. <clears throat> so let's explain a little bit about why it's important and how it works. So this is a standard virtualization model. Everybody, this should be quite uh, uh, common. So you have a, a host operating system, and you have maybe two workloads, two applications, which are running. <clears throat> so. Isolation uh, is about protecting things from each other. And typically, we talk about the CIA triad. C is confidentiality. That is keeping things uh, so that other people can't see them, or other processes can't see them. I is integrity. That is protecting them from being changed by unauthorized uh, entities. And the last one is availability, making sure that your data and your application can be used when you wish. Generally, it's pretty easy to know when something is available. If your application isn't running, you can usually tell. But 
protecting confidentiality and integrity is much more complex. So let's talk about the three types of isolation. The first one is workload from workload. So if you have the workload on the left, it should not be able to uh, interfere with your workload on the right. You want to protect the, the, the confidentiality and integrity of that workload. And um, type two is host from workload. You do not want your host, your operating system, your hypervisor, your other applications uh, which are running as part of the host to be interfered with by workloads. So if you're running a cloud, for instance, if you're a CSP or a hyperscaler, you want to protect your infrastructure from the workloads. And these are fairly easy. We know how to do these things, hypervisors and, uh, uh, and containers and uh, sec comps and SC Linux are all techniques we use to protect these. These are, these are quite easy. I should say the slides will be available and are available now if you wish to look at them later on. Um, so uh, what about uh, the third type of isolation? This is protecting the workload from the host. This is more difficult because virtual machines, hypervisors, uh, and container uh, does not protect this. Because the way that virtualization works is typically your, uh, your VM uh, manager, your hypervisor, your container management system understands the data uh, and the, the memory pages that your workloads are running in uh, and can change them if they wish. And this is kind of fine if you trust everything. But I don't trust everything. I'm a security guy. Uh, and banks don't trust everything, and healthcare providers don't trust everything, and enterprise, nobody, nobody trusts everything. So this is the problem that we are trying to address. And privacy enhancing technologies like confidential computing are largely about providing these types of isolation, particularly type three. So let's go back to this definition. This is exactly what uh, confidential computing does. It is providing uh, the protection, not just for your data, but actually also for the application while it is in use. And it uses capabilities provided at the chip level to protect that data, to encrypt it whilst it's in use. So what it does is it creates what's called a trusted execution environment, which allows you to create a, a section or a set of memory pages into which you can load your application and its associated data and protect it. And I won't go into detail today. We don't have the time. But there are also mechanisms called attestation, which provide measurements of the, uh, the data to and then sign them cryptographically so that you can check that these have been set up correctly. This is important because let's say uh, you go to a cloud provider and you say to the cloud provider, well, I'm going to use confidential computing because I don't trust you. Um, I have my customer's data, and I don't trust you not to look at it. And more importantly, the, the regulator, the government, doesn't trust you not to look at it. So you say, please, will you set up a trusted execution environment? And they say, yes, it's done. And I say, wait, wait, wait a moment. How can I trust you? To do that, if I've said I don't trust you, how can I trust you to set that up? And the answer to that is that you use the capabilities in the chip to provide you with a cryptographically signed measurement which you can verify so that you don't need to trust 
your cloud provider. You don't need to trust the host OS, the hypervisor, the container management, and all of those pieces. You're reducing the trust. I will talk a little bit about that as well. So TEs uh, encrypt the workloads, and they protect the integrity and the confidentiality of your workloads. They don't protect the availability because, of course, again, hypervisors or kernels can uh, do resource starvation. They can just say, well, I'm not going to give you the clock cycles uh, to, to manage, or I'm not going to process data in and out uh, on the network, for instance. But they do provide confidentiality and integrity protection. So why is this important to the cloud? So this is a slightly uh, complex picture taken, taken from my book, in fact. Um, and this is kind of what your, uh, your stack looks like if you're putting something in the cloud. And there are an awful lot of different layers here, right? So um, in the virtual machine, uh, which is the bit on the left, um, you've got all of your stuff, right? You've got your application. You've got the middleware, the user space, the kernel, the bootloader, and the BIOS. They are all, let's say you control those completely. OK. But there are many pieces on the host system that you do not and you cannot control. It doesn't matter how big a customer you are. If you go to Google or Amazon Web Services or to Azure or to Rackspace or to any, of, uh, any other CSP, they will not give you the details of all of these different pieces. And typically, different um, actors, different entities will control or provide these different layers, which is why they're in different colors. So your firmware may come from one uh, provider, your bootloader and kernel from another, your BIOS from someone else. So there may, it can, may come from many different pieces. And this is uh, part of the problem. So although the cloud is great, it allows us to do digital transformation, to move things into the cloud, to, uh, to, put, to expand as we need to scale out, not have to worry about managing all of, our, uh, all of the, the, the stack, there are trust issues. How can I know that the bootloader or the firmware or the kernel will not interfere with or export or otherwise do bad things with the things in my VM or my container. It's very similar. What you really want to do is not trust any of that. You want to avoid trusting all of them. And so this is what a T does. Now, there is one thing you are going to need to trust. And that is the CPU, or the GPU if you're doing that. I haven't shown that here. And that is because something has to run the instructions. Something has to do the processing. So you have to trust that to some degree, which is why we do the attestation and why we do the cryptographic proof. But what a TEE, a trusted execution environment, does is protect your application and your workload from all of the rest of it. And so this allows you to do all the things that you want to do. It allows you uh, to have data privacy, whether that is for customer data, for patient data, for cryptographic keys, for uh, pharmace pharmaceutical modeling, for AI uh, models, for instance, allows you to think about data sovereignty. This is a very big question at the moment because sorry, many companies wish to be using, uh, for instance, cloud uh, or big, big companies to uh, process data, to manage data. But many countries are very keen that there should not be the possibility that other countries or other actors from other countries can get access to that data. 
This is something that I'm very pleased governments are taking seriously. Um, and you, we're seeing you know, many countries saying, well, you, you can't be using particular applications or particular uh, cloud providers because we don't trust them. And this is something which can go away if you use confidential computing. Because if, let's say, the, uh, the computer, the, the host, is in, I don't know, Germany, uh, but I am a British company and I don't trust uh, the, the German company, it's more likely to be the French. I don't, it's uh, many years we've had uh, disagreements with the French in the United Kingdom. But let's say I don't trust them. Even if I don't trust them, if I put my application into a trusted execution environment, I can have cryptographic assurances that they cannot change or mess with that. So this is all good. It allows us to think about using the cloud in new ways. But why is uh, it is important to be thinking about open source? Well, those are the pieces that you want to be open source because you want as much of what you do trust as possible to be open source. I mean, really, you want, you want to trust that piece and that to be open source as well, right? Um, but you, that is your application. You can do with it what you want. So why is that important, though? So the first reason is that the best security is possible with the fewest number of trust relationships. I don't want to have to worry about having relationships with four, five, six, or, well, with, with the previous picture, all of those different entities. I want to have as few trust relationships as possible. And the other thing is that security is always complex and is always difficult to do, possible, uh, to do correctly or as correctly as possible. There is no perfect security. I'm sorry, but there just isn't. But the more that is visible and auditable, the better. And this is a really important word. I am a techie. My background is as a programmer. I program very badly, so I moved to management. Um, but for me, I am interested in, in doing all this stuff right. But for business people and for regulators and for companies, auditability is absolutely vital. And open source allows everything to be auditable. So from my point of view, the less code the as possible, the fewer numbers of trust relationships, and the more open source, the better, because it is auditable, it is visible, and you can check what's going on. Without open source, you cannot have transparency, and transparency is important. It's always one of those strange things that security people who worry about confidentiality want transparency. But you want the underlying technologies to be as transparent as is absolutely possible. There's an interesting thing that's missing from this. Can anyone guess what's missing that I haven't shown as open source? I'll, I'll take that, the CPU. I am happy if, I'm happiest, shall we say, if the CPU and the associated firmware and instruction set is also open source. Uh, and so there are some providers who are doing that. So for instance, uh, uh, Risk OS is a, uh, a member of the Confidential Computing Consortium, and that's all open source. And some of the other providers are also looking to move more and more of what they do to open source. 
So let me talk a little bit about uh, the confidential computing ecosystem. I think I'll also have some time to have a slightly more technical conversation about what's going on if people are interested. So we'll do that. But let me first do this. So when you're building an application and you want to run it, there are a whole bunch of different things you need to do. And, and here's the first bit, right? <clears throat> you need a chip to run your application on. So we need silicon manufacturers and vendors and designers and vendors. So there are a number of models. You've got uh, people like AMD or Intel or Huawei who kind of sit on the left. They make and uh, uh, design and make and sell their own silicon. On the right, you've got other people like uh, maybe uh, ARM or RISC uh, and uh, Samsung, for instance, uh, oh, and Intel and AMD, actually, who take, who either create um, uh, CPU uh, designs, silicon designs, and then uh, manufacture them uh, and, and sell them. So you need that. You also need people like uh, your your OEMs, the people who create and make, uh, make the hardware. So that might be uh, people like Fujitsu or Mitsubishi or Dell or HP who are making this information and selling it to the data centers or to you, our customers as well. And then you have operating system vendors. So this is your Microsofts, your Canonicals, your Red Hats, your Zuzas. Um, those are the main ones I can think of at the moment. There are some others around there as well. Huawei does, does so as well. Um, but you need all of them because in order to use this, it needs to be, uh, to use confidential computing, it needs to be turned on in the kernel. You need the correct libraries and the correct management pieces to, uh, to do it. And then you need the TE platform projects and the vendors. So when I showed you uh, this picture here, this one here, um, those orange pieces, uh, somebody needs to do that, right? Someone needs to put that together and package it and uh, make it all work. And uh, that is what TE platform projects and vendors do. So uh, in the Confidential Computing Consortium, we have a number of projects doing that. I will talk about those in a bit. And these are the pieces which are most important to be open source, because these are the bits that you need to be able to trust, right? Um, and on top of that, you want to be able actually to use this, right? So it needs to be uh, provided by CSPs, hyperscalers. Uh, this is your Alibabas, your, uh, your Azures, uh, your Googles, uh, people like that. And then you have ISVs. So for each uh, uh, sector you can think of, banking, pharmaceutical, um, auto manufacture, uh, telecom, you will have people writing applications which use confidential computing um, to make it easy for you to adopt. Um, and SaaS providers. People are going to be providing these as SaaS products as well. And of course, last but not least, the end users on top. My personal point of view, I'd like to see all of that open source all the time, but we don't live in that world yet. Keep coming for another 20, 30 years and maybe, I don't know. This is the right conference for that. So, what is the Confidential Computing Consortium? Well, it's about doing this, right? And we are uh, about a, we're a community, first of all. We are part of the Linux Foundation, which is you know, why I'm here. Um, and we want to create and promote projects, open source projects, um, to manage data in use uh, and to promote uh, the adoption of confidential computing through open collaboration. So we do a number of things. We do technical work. So we have uh, some very uh, active work in our technical advisory groups and the, the SIGs, 
special interest groups, looking at the low-level technical issues about protocols, about attestation about how you can apply this, for instance, to regulators and standards, uh, the work of NIST or CSA, for instance. Um, we also do outreach and marketing. Um, I, I suspect that many of you here didn't know much about confidential computing. How many of you here had heard of confidential computing before you saw this talk listed? OK, so that's not enough. So I'm pleased. I have more people know about confidential computing, but we need to let people know that this is available. We wish to grow the ecosystem um, because uh, we need all of those uh, sections to be filled in those boxes. Uh, and also working with regulators, working with standards bodies, so that um, they know when you're talking about GDPR, for instance, that if you use confidential computing um, in a particular way, that you can meet some of those requirements uh, about data protection, privacy protection, data sovereignty. So we're working with a number of regulators and standards bodies and governments and want to do more of that as well. Um, this is, I think, slightly out of date, but it's pretty close. Uh, a, a list of our members. There are some uh, premier members down the bottom. You'll see some big ones. Uh, and uh, our general members on the right are also some big ones. But many startups as well. Uh, we encourage startups. We have people from, you know, who are making billions of dollars and have tens of thousands of employees. And we have people who are making no money and have two or three employees. We also have some associate members who are either at different consortiums uh, or academics or government organizations like RISC, Lenaro, uh, and, uh, and people like that. Um, if you don't see your organization listed here, but you are at this uh, talk, then you should consider joining. There. I've done my, uh, done my selling bit for the day. We have uh, members or projects in all of these different boxes that I showed you before. Um, and uh, some of them span multiple boxes. So if you think about, I don't know, uh, uh, Microsoft, they are, a, uh, they are an OEM. They are a, an operating system vendor. They are an ISV. They are a CSP. So they span multiple of those boxes. And it's sometimes interesting to see different parts of organization, uh, organizations arguing about which are the most important parts of that. But that's, uh, uh, that could be fun. I used to be at Red Hat. And IBM and Red Hat have very different priorities. Um, but it's, the, it's open source. It's the Linux Foundation. Everyone can get along and be very friendly. Yes, good. OK, let's, let's hope. Uh, and these are, uh, these are the projects, the open source projects. Um, there are two more which are in the process of being approved at the moment, Rust SPDM uh, and the Certifier Framework. Uh, there are at least two more which are going through at the moment, which have been presented to the CCC. One is the, uh, uh, the ILET, that's I-S-L-E-T, project from Samsung. Uh, and another one uh, is a work between, uh, I think, Huawei and Red Hat. I can't remember exactly. So, and we have other ones coming along as well. So how can we, how can you get involved in uh, all of the interesting things uh, that is going on. So we have very varied uh, makeup of our members, very different types of organizations. Uh, I said across all of these uh, different areas, um, from very large to very small, one of the things that we are doing at the moment and one of the reasons that I'm speaking to you here is expanding into the Asia Pacific region. There is a lot of interest, a lot of pull from customers. There's a lot of regulatory in interest in privacy enhancing technologies and data and use protection. And our members are doing work here. And so we want to be spending more time and growing the membership to represent the needs of Linux Foundation members and general uh, interest members uh, across Asia Pacific. Um, 
We absolutely are committed uh, to, uh, to open source uh, and we want people to get involved. But not everyone can get involved as much. If you're a small company, you maybe can't do as much. You can focus on the pieces that you're interested in. <clears throat> Um, so some of the things that are, are very big, as I said, uh, would be industry visibility, uh, making sure people know about it, Asia PAC uh, growth there. We also want to be helping people understand good ways that are useful for them to, uh, to, do, to use uh, the technology. Um, so we're working on uh, use cases so that we can publish those so people say, oh yes, that fits what I need to do, for instance. Um, it's, there are so many use cases, so many different sectors, it's difficult to think of a sector in which you don't care about the privacy uh, and integrity of your data. Everyone has data that they want to protect. Um, but this is about not just security, it's about risk. When it comes down to it, all security should really be about risk. Um, the sort of people who care about this are your CISOs, your Chief Information Security Officers. And although their title has the word security in it, none of them care about security. I'm, I'm sorry, they don't. They care about risk. They care about managing risk, understanding risk, mitigating risk. And if you have technologies such as any privacy enhancing technology, including confidential computing, which allows you to change how you manage, change how you think about the risk to your organization, to your customers, to their data, to your uh, business, then that is a new thing that you should be paying attention to. So uh, before I go questions, I will, I will quickly uh, uh, talk about kind of what happens here. So, Basically, normally, in, uh, when you're doing computing, uh, you're, you have a bunch of memory pages in, which make up a workload in RAM, right? Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. What a TE uh, does is it uh, encrypts those uh, memory pages so that in RAM, any other uh, process with access to uh, to those memory pages, including a hypervisor or the kernel, can't look at them. The exact technology is slightly different between different um, versions available, but this is the basic uh, idea. Um, and each uh, TE instance has a different cryptographic key, so um, that means that one can't look at the other, so they are, there is isolation uh, between them. And so it's only when the memory page actually goes into the CPU that it is decrypted and it is then encrypted again when it goes back into RAM, which provides the protection. So that's just a very brief uh, description. So um, we have a few minutes left, I believe, five minutes left, I think, for, uh, for questions. So uh, yeah, are there any questions that I can try to answer for you? So the question was, for multi-core workloads accessing the same memory, is that possible? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, the early technologies, it wasn't so easy. Um, but yeah, Intel, AMD, ARM folks have absolutely nailed that, that sort of question. When it gets kind of interesting is uh, when you're doing it across different systems and trying to think about migration. There's some very complex issues there. One thing that's happening now is beginning to take off. Off. I talked about mainly CPUs, but if you think of AI workloads, for instance, they often use GPUs. How can you establish a trust relationship between a GPU and a CPU? And there's exactly work going on in that, in things like the IETF, which again, the, com the Confidential Computing Consortium is involved with um, to make sure that that all happens. So yes to your question and, and beyond as well to, to the question. Any, any other questions, please? Oh, there's one over there, sir. Are there any good reasons to not use Are there any good reasons not to use trusted computing? Uh, 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 confidential computing. Trusted computing rather different. I, I, have, I take issues with the word trusted computing, but you have to read the book to understand why. Um, are there any good reasons not to? 
Um, so it's not, it's not easy for all workloads yet. It's getting there. Um, it's uh, the, not all CPUs provide it. Um, and typically, it's a server-based technology. That's changing because ARM has brought out in ARM 9 capabilities, and RISC is also doing that as well. So, it's, uh, so for instance, the Islet project I talked about from Samsung is about doing this, using this technology on mobile phones and other mobile devices. So it doesn't fit for everything there yet. Uh, the performance is, is negligible difference, generally not a problem. There's one interesting one, which we don't talk about much. Um, if you care about workload density, so typically when, <coughs> sorry, when you're running uh, applications, let's say a, a set of containers on a host in the cloud, think a pod, something like that, many of them will be able to share memory pages, right? Uh, because you know, you've got the single kernel, and unless you're writing to stuff, which often you're not in the kernel, hopefully, um, you can share those memory pages. You can't do that typically with confidential computing. So your workload density uh, is maybe reduced. Now, there are some ways around that, some interesting stuff happening, but that's one thing you need to be, uh, need to be aware of. In most use cases, not a problem. So I think it's about ease of use. Um, again, things like this, the GPU offload is coming technology. It's not mature yet. Uh, so I think it's largely about the maturity and people knowing about it. Any other questions? We have, I think, a couple more questions. Yes. OK, so the question is, how does a cracker attack the data in a GP, GP or a CPU, for example? Thank you for using the word cracker, sir. I really appreciate that. Um, we use the word hacker negatively too much, so yeah, fine. Uh, so um, the, the answer to that is there are a number of, uh, number of attacks which uh, are not uh, which are some easier, some, some harder. As I said, there is no perfect. Uh, perfect security. There are a number of uh, side channel attacks which uh, can, in certain circumstances, leak data. So, for instance, if you're doing uh, key cryptographic key material work, you uh, may need to be looking at things like constant time cryptography implementations within your trusted execution environment. Um, most of the uh, attacks require long term physical access to the chip. Um, and that there are other uh, mitigations and other protections uh, for those sorts of things. But most, uh, most attacks are very difficult with confidential computing. It depends on the technology and the maturity. Um, but there are most of them require long-term physical access and scanning an electron microscopes or uh, uh, microscopes or um, the ability, for instance, to be varying voltages on the chip. These are quite complex long-term attacks. I think you have time maybe for, uh, for one more question, if, uh, if we have any more questions. Please, sir. So the presentation today mainly focused on the protecting the data of the virtual machines. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, there, will be a, there is a project called Confidential Containers in CNCF. So, do you have any relationship with yeah, yeah. the Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, so confidential containers is, uh, uses confidential computing uh, technology underneath. And there are, a number of, there are a number of projects, some of which sit in CNCS, some of which fit in the Confidential Computing Consortium, and we're all very friendly. <laughs> um, so, the workloads, it depends how you define a workload. You can make the entire pod a workload. Or you could say just the container instance itself as a workload. And so how you draw that boundary uh, depends on how you define your isolation uh, granularity, basically. So um, you, could put your, you could put an entire 
you know, operating system, if you wish, in it. And again, I think it's a, important to think about not only how many trust relationships you have, because if you think about not just a pod, but even in a single container, the number of dependencies can be very high. Um, but also, you know, your TCB. So the smaller your trusted compute base, the smaller the TCB, uh, the, the higher level of security you may be able to assure. So there are interesting trade-offs. I think around here, some of which are technological, some of which are supply chain, some of which are process based. So great question. Thank you. So I thank you very much indeed for your questions. Um, please do get in touch with me uh, if you wish. I am available uh, either via, via shed or uh, we're getting there. Oh, it's a long way back. So here we, uh, there we go. So uh, you can find me via that. Um, thank you for your time and have a good conference. Arigato.